I kind of moved into just, you know, making short films with my brothers and that. Like, we'd do, like, James Bond parodies and, like, just little horror films and things. And then, yeah, just I just fell in love with it just from there, just, you know, and then just kind of it just evolved. Did you think everything was a viable now? Like, well, you didn't think about career or anything. You just did it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a tough one because it's being a film director, it's, you don't really think that it is a viable option. But, you know, I, I'm kind of like where I'm like, well, I enjoy it. This is what I enjoy doing. And as long as I still enjoy it, then hopefully it will be viable if I can do it right eventually. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And now, you made, you know, you've proved yourself you're bankable, even at a small scale. You know, the film made its money back. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that's all I got to do. Now just make it a little bigger, make a little bit more money back, and then just go from there. Yeah, and I mean, especially when I see, like, just rating scores, just even on IMDb or Rotten Tomatoes, when some films that have, you know, $100,000 million productions and they've got zero ten percent ratings on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. And I know mine's not a huge rating. I think it's sitting at 50% or something like that. Yeah. But at least I know that, well, for a $10,000 production, I've still got, you know, a better <laughs> rating than some movies that are $1 million, $2 million, $10 million production. Plus IMDb credit as an indirect producer. Like, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. But yeah. like I said, it is like, the ratings are at fifty percent, and I know there's a lot of problems with it. And if I could go back and we were shooting on five Ds, like like I said, yeah. we had one fifty mil lens, completely unstabilized, and also there's not like there was no YouTube back then to learn stuff. Yeah. So you didn't like you're not making good films because you're not watching YouTube, getting educated. You just cut through the weeds, <laughs> <laughs> hacking through the weeds yourself, trying to figure out what works. You know, come back as scenes noisy. You're like, now fucking what? You know, yeah. pixel by pixel removal. We're doing an After Effects. I think even for the poster. You see Neil's face with the red tape. Yeah. I think that was one of the only, like, high-def images we had. I think it was like a JPEG image, like a snapshot. It must have taken a still on set. On set. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's a cool photo yeah. for, for the poster anyway. Yeah. But it was lucky that we'd act, somebody had actually just snapped that photo. I think that was me. Because <laughs> I think I wanted to, <clears throat> to compare what movie was doing, the moving image and compression and everything was doing compared to their raw format. Yeah, right. Because well, that the recording wall wasn't an option either. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, that's that, it's like a godsend because I was like, well, this is all we've got to work with. So yeah, this yeah. is the poster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but now, like, you know, now you're pulling stills out of 8K stills out, you know? Yeah. And it's like, holy shit, this is fine, almost fine for print. You just, like, run it through a pass, pretend it's 300 DPI, and then you can print that shit. It looks fine. Yeah. Yeah. But, man, we're talking early days of filmmaking. Like, like literally, what made that film, I think, what made all that sort of happen and stuff was almost like the 5D coming out. Because I, I remember getting that when that first was arrived, we were barely allowed to touch it. And then you push it, you, put, you have a look and you're like, man, that shallow depth of field? You yeah. couldn't really see that because before you're shooting on these camcorder motherfuckers. So, and then all of a sudden I was like, this looks like a, a cinematic. Yeah. That's the first birth of that word, you know, yeah. in terms of me being able to do it. Yeah. And then from there, you, and then I ran into you and I was like, I think this will be a good application for this look yeah. you know what you're trying to say lots of natural light late scenes full sodium vapor street light you know all this yeah, crazy yeah. stuff going on heaps of fluoros and let's see what this camera can do and now we look at the stats you know if you're just looking at statistics you're like 1080p <laughs> 25 frames a second is all you could record or 24 yeah it's got like eight stops of usable highlights it clips so fucking hard and yeah. <laughs> but like and so, and just things like that. And as it gets noisy, real, you know. Really easily. Yeah. And so if you compare that to like what Red Komodo is like, you know, today shooting 8K, everything's clean, everything's smooth, everything, you know, totally different beast. When you're making a film, it's like basically like Dr. J era, yeah. <laughs> NBA, you know. Yeah. I think that's what annoys me with Netflix is everything's become so, you know, just generic and formulaic with yeah. the way the productions are that nobody's taking risks anymore. It kind of gets, that's why I feel stale a little did, bit. Did you hear Matt Damon come out and say, or do you mean, did you feel like the the, the landscape is stale? Superhero just, movies after superhero movies. After. I'm just talking about even just productions on Netflix. They all, I mean, they're all looking the same. It's like, yeah. Super yeah. high key, super, it's almost like they got their own look, but that look is as soon as I, like as soon as I see it, I click off, you know, really high key, like a TV commercial kind of thing. But yeah, here's what it is. That's the new yeah. daytime cinema, you know, yeah. it's like if you say in the look when, you know, Picture Murder She Wrote <laughs> when the daytime movies look like Murder She Wrote, you know, one shot in a square frame, 
That's true. Yeah. So like, so I think that's just what they're doing. They're doing made for TV movies, but except it's made for Netflix movies and they're just doing them low budget, streaming them through. Yeah. Getting, you know, so, but that'd be a fucking fun industry to get into, right? What's that? Like how many good directors like Tony Scott, Ridley Scott, I'm pretty sure they came from like made for TV movies and then got into blockbusters. Like I just watched Armageddon the other day. Like, damn, that's a busy movie. Like, there's a lot happens in that movie. A lot of scenes, a lot of action, very big. So many stars, so many things like that. That guy sewed all that together. Armageddon. Armageddon, yeah. The movie. The movie. Yeah, yeah. Bruce Willis and the... I've always found weird with that, with the, the plot point, the plot loophole, is that why couldn't you just train the astronauts to drill? <laughs> why did you have to train Bruce Willis to be an astronaut? <laughs> yeah, did they not think an astronaut can handle drilling training? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, you're very valuable. You can't hold a jackhammer. He, he yeah. must be a very good driller. Like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I sort of was tuning in and out because I was kind of doing something at the time and then watch a bit here, watch a bit there. And every time I look back, it's like completely different look, feel, sets. You know, they're on a mid, because it goes through like him and Liv Tyler's love and, you know, on a drill set and my dad won't let me. I'm just, it is a good movie. Yeah, and it, yeah. but this goes all the way through to them getting obliterated in the sky, like playing nukes and stuff. Yeah, it is a good movie. I like that movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I'm just thinking like, you know, to sew all of those elements together, that big, you know what I really want to figure out is how they do those, how they used to do those Hollywood sparks. Like the intro to MacGyver or anytime you see an explosion on MacGyver or something, it's really sparky explosion. Just like movie, you know, think Terminator scenes or something like that. And there's <laughs> sparks like flying on people when they're creeping through the factory. I reckon those sparks are underrated and they would make a good movie. You could just sit down in a few years. You'd be like J.J. Abrams with the, lo- the lens flare. <laughs> <laughs> You'll just be all about the spark. That's the thing with YouTube that's changed is the distinction of voices in directors has, cha- has become unified almost because like they all watch the same YouTube tutorial or there's the same you know YouTuber showing you how to do shit and then everyone goes out and does it and for, you know everything starts looking the same. They've got anamorphic look, with, you know, whatever. But yeah. I find that when... <laughs> When I started getting to After Effects, early days at After Effects, Andrew Kramer on Video Copilot was the only guy doing that stuff. And so, you know, I'd be doing a force ball in my head, you know, a landing impact explosion with a city. And I'm like, this looks fucking amazing. And then, you know, I go click on Vimeo or something. There's like a million people with the same <laughs> test set. Or well, not a million, maybe like, you know, a hundred people that had done the same tutorial and put their shit on Vimeo. Because <laughs> yeah. they're all learning from one source, you know. So, but now it's like infinite. You can sort of, yeah. Yeah. I, I think just, I made the opposite of what the point I was trying to make. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, like you just got to grab a hold of a camera and get your idea and shoot. I just did a review on you know, Peter Jackson's Bad Taste. you seen that one? Yeah, yeah. And he, he just shot that with his mates on weekends over the course of a couple of years. Yeah. Finally slapped it together. I think it was made for 25000 Yeah. And, you know, when you look at that, that mm-hmm. film and then, you know, 10, 15 years later in Lord of the Rings, yeah, you're just like wow. And like, there was, a, but there was a really weird leap in that, like that he went through. So he went from uh, Meet the Feebles, like a yeah. puppet porno weird fucking thing, and then the next thing he did, I'm pretty sure, was the Frighteners with Michael J. Yeah, uh, Michael J. Fox. Yeah, yeah, Michael J. Fox. And so, like, so something happened in between there. Like, you don't go from Meet the Feebles to a Hollywood, big yeah. Hollywood film with VFX and shit. Yeah. So. Well, he was always into the prosthetics and the the. The creature effects. Yeah. So, I don't know, must have transferred over to CGI. You know, he must have had a big interest in the CGI. Oh, his practical knowledge transfers into CGI, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's where we're at now with Unreal. Like, I really think this is the era where that's the unachieved, previously unachievable. And then, like, now how do we blend this to make really big product, to add production value to indie productions? Yeah. Like, I think this is the, that screen, the green screen era of our era. Yeah. I mean, even just using Unreal, like how they did, Minimally for Forrest Gump and things like that. You can oh, even yeah. use Unreal minimally in films. Oh, you know, yeah. and, and if you just did it subtly, you, you probably wouldn't even know the difference. Well, yeah, because you, know, you, you can look at the feather in the opening scene now and say, oh, that's CGI. Maybe because I've seen the making of and I sort of like, now I can, maybe I couldn't before and now I can see it, but I don't know. But then, you know, Lieutenant Dan's leg, like all they did was drape, you know, paint it green. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's just gone and it looks good. And, you know, him appearing in all the footage and stuff like that, that's it. But that's a good use, and that's why I think this film's great, really, is because that's a good use of reinforcing a narrative with technology. I think when you go the other way, you got the technology and you go, fuck yeah, and write a story around that technology, it seems to never pan out as good. No. But if you've got, if you take technology and you just make sure every 
freaking thing you do reinforces that. You're good. And that's why CGI today is just so, you know, they, the whole movie is CGI and the VFX artists are getting paid to, to obviously slap out 120 minutes worth of CGI. And it's all under, under par because they've got a deadline and yeah. they're just they're having to slap it out and it just ends up looking cheap. I don't know how they, they can afford to. You see how many compositors they have at the end of a film. Like, you know, it's like four columns of credits and it goes for like six pages of film from all around the world. Yeah. And you're like, how is this more viable than doing practical effects, you know, where you've got a yeah. big crew on set taking care of it? Yeah. It, and, and the practical effects look so much better. Yeah. You know? Back to the future stuff. Yeah. I find it's just like so much earthy, more earthy, and like you get, it's part of the world. Yeah. You can see it's part of the world. You know, the Marvel films are, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you remember when you did the gunshot? Of John getting shot and falling into the grave. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us about that night? This is on Wrong Night Stan. Yeah, so we did have a we had a guy doing a practical effect with the tube up the back and the the pump with the the blood because uh, the one of the killers gets killed at the end. And so then we did take up. We did like oh, it must have been four or five takes, and this pump just was not working. It was just. It would, he'd pump her and it would, it'd be a tiny little bit of a squirt. And it's just like, I was like, I looked at each shot. I was like, oh, that's shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think eventually, what did we have to, I can't remember where we had to, I think it was just getting late and oh, it was cold. It was, it was cold and cold. I was running out of space on the camera. Yeah. The battery was going flat. Yeah. And I thought, this is the last take. Try this. And yeah, none of it worked. And I, and I eventually just had to, once again, cut around that. I had to get use a cool, really quick, like, mini-second shot of the the blood. You just, where you just see his shirt with the blood, and it cuts back to the back of him, and then yeah, it cuts yeah. to the front. You know, and you hear the gunshot. You know he's been shot, and yeah. he falls in. But, yeah, once again. Just to edit it around. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, still, I would have liked to see that kind of blood splatter. Yeah. It would have been good, but. Yeah, the guy we got is, is you know, it was a hundred bucks, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> can, you, can you do this? Yeah, yeah. I can do that. Yeah, is that sure. a bike pump? I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's you know, you want independent thinkers to do independent films, you know, like yeah, can you fuck it? It is a look, you know, it's part of the look I think now. Next time I could probably do it myself, like because of the YouTube videos now, you know. But yeah, like yeah. we were talking about before, there's no no YouTube videos, you know, back in 2012. Well. If there was, it was very minimal. I'd always love to work with squibs too, you know, the exploding ones out of their chest they use and stuff. Yeah. Like, I reckon let's do a film with squibs and sparks. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Good. Well, yeah. I'd like to get into that whole prosthetics in, in my next film, just even if there's just one character that's got some sort of, you know, he's he's not quite right, like, not like the elephant man or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, But yeah. just something, you know, like. Yeah, no eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> This big over. over. Get unreal for that. Like but. Terminator 1 side profile when he's like, you can see the putty over his stuff. <laughs> Actually, I just really just missed it, but there was a film festival in the city and it was all 35 mil and 16 mil films and I watched Heavy Metal. It's like, have you seen that, Heavy Metal? No, I haven't. Dude, that shit is wild. That's what's into it. That's pretty much like what's inspired this new music video. But like that, that movie is so crazy. Me and Dustin went and watched it and man, we walked out so inspired and then Terminator 1 straight off the bat. And that's really inspiring for independent filmmakers because you can see like how he's cutting the Terminator scenes using like, yeah, stop motion, tiny models and stuff like that. And then make, woven it in and it's fucking great. Like yeah. it still sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. It's so good. There's so many, there's, there's a real blueprint out there for filmmakers to look at and it's these guys and their work. Yeah, definitely. Peter Jackson and uh, James Cameron. Yeah. David Lynch. Lynchy. I mean, yeah. He's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even Christopher Nolan, you know, to some respect, you know, how deep he goes and how he researches and yeah. stories and depth and yeah. yeah, infinite budget. What do you do with infinite budget? You know, like, yeah. do what Christopher Nolan's doing. <laughs> yeah. And it, it is good to look at some of these directors, especially the ones that started out with nothing. Yeah, you know, their early films are where they had nothing. That's our blueprint. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's good to just look at that and then just say, well, what, what did they do? You know, and how could I do that? Because they really made the films with nothing. Do you worry about, I mean, you know, a lot of people, including Matt Damon, have come out and said that that was the era they could do that because the student, you know, 
I th- who was it at the time? The studios were getting bored or something and there was no oversight, oversight from the studio. So they all, it was 94 and they all made all these amazing 